Hello, everybody. This is Mark Engman. I'm Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at UNICEF USA. We are going to go ahead and get this webinar started. I see people are still coming online. We have a lot to get through, so I don't want to waste any time. Just a couple of quick notes. This session will be recorded, uh, and then we'll make that recording available afterwards. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, with such limited time, I can't promise that we'll get to your questions, but we'll try to respond at some fashion at some point. Um, and with all, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Ayan. Ayan is a senior in high school from Arizona and a UNICEF USA National Council, mem Council member. He's gonna kick us off today. Ayan, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for joining our State of the World's Children Report virtual briefing on mental health and well-being. My name is Ayan Siddiqui, and like Mr. Engman referenced, I am a UNICEF USA National Youth Council member. But on top of that, I'm also 16 years old. And on the 26th of this month, I'll be celebrating my 17th birthday. It's a bit of a bittersweet one. While celebrating another year in my chaotic life is always welcome, I found that in these last two years, finding something to celebrate has become harder than ever. The world has toughened. As COVID-19 heads into its third year, the impact on children and young people's mental health and well-being continues to weigh heavily. Almost all children across the globe have been directly impacted by lockdowns and school closures, the, the disruption to routines, education, recreation, as well as concern for family income and health, which has left many young people feeling afraid, angry, and concerned for their future. And that's where we come into the picture. Reminiscent of Malcolm X's persevering beliefs for an equal society, similar to Malala Yousafzai's courageous advocacy for equitable education akin to Greta Thunberg's fight for climate justice, we too should bolster the next generation with the tools they need. And that starts with being aware of mental health. Like physical health, mental health should be thought of as a positive. It underlies our capacity to think, feel, learn, work, and build meaningful relationships and contribute to our communities and the world. It's an intrinsic part of individual health and a foundation for healthy communities and nations. We need to remember that mental health exists on a continuum that includes both periods of well being and periods of distress. Protective factors like safe, inclusive schools and supportive parenting can help to nurture positive mental health. But all countries, rich and poor alike, are facing a huge gap between mental health needs and access to quality services. That's why we brought together this collection of fantastic speakers, including congressional champions, UNICEF experts, community partners, and youth advocates to explore examples of evidence-based programs to tackle the global mental health crisis and steps forward to support children around the world for a better future. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zainab Hijazi to present the findings of UNICEF's State of the World's Children Report. Dr. Hijazi has 15 years of experience supporting community-based mental health and psychosocial programs globally. Based in New York, she currently works within UNICEF's program division and provides program guidance and technical support to enhance UNICEF's multi-sectoral approach to the provision of mental health and psychosocial support for children and families in humanitarian and development settings. This includes policy and advocacy work at UNICEF headquarters and supporting UNICEF country teams in designing and implementing locally relevant, comprehensive, and sustainable MHPSS strategies that one, promote safe, nurturing environments for the recovery, psychosocial well being, and protection of children, and two, engage children caregivers and families, community systems and service providers at all levels of the social ecological framework. Thank you.
All right, good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And thank you so much, Ayan. Um, and thank you to everybody here for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, last week, UNICEF launched our flagship State of the World's Children Report, which focuses on child and adolescent mental health for the first time since publication began in 1980. In fact, for UNICEF, the key issue of the moment is mental health, and it is one of four priorities for the agency over the coming four years. Now, the main message is clear. Children, youth, and caregivers should be a priority for global mental health research, advocacy, and programming. And while we can't have this conversation about prioritizing mental health without acknowledging that we are in a time of COVID, it's important to note that even before COVID-19, children and youth were already carrying the burden of mental health risks, with half of all mental disorders developing before age 15 and 75% by early adulthood making the case for early intervention before age 15 quite clear. And the risk for mental health conditions and psychosocial problems are often exacerbated by poverty, violence, disease, or humanitarian crisis. And the effects of mental health problems in childhood and adolescence can persist with serious health and socioeconomic implications throughout the life course. Even if we just don't have the data to estimate the pandemic's long-term impact on children's mental health, we know from numerous accounts that it's been very challenging. We heard from Ion, and, and these accounts include, you know, also consultations from with, you know, with children and adolescents in 13 countries that UNICEF organized in collaboration with Johns Hopkins University. The codes on the screen demonstrate how many children around the world experienced the pandemic as a very stressful time in their lives. So why does it feel like we are just now starting to talk about and hear about the impacts of the world's many challenges on the mental health and well-being of children? having some uh, slide issues. Um, well, even though huge stigma and misunderstanding continues to exist around mental health problems, there's this feeling that the plates have started to shift in recent years and that there's this growing awareness of mental health problems as a concern. The pandemic may represent a tipping point that helps draw attention to mental health as an issue. It's raised awareness of mental health and highlighted fragility of services. And this growing awareness includes a stronger understanding based on people's own experiences during the pandemic and also an awareness that it has, we, we have come to understand better the cost of poor mental health. Sorry, yeah. Um, so as the social and economic ramifications of the pandemic continue across the globe, data in the report exposes the breadth and depth of child and adolescent mental health issues globally. Um, and the fact that the magnitude of the need for mental health and psychosocial support is simply not being met with the response needed. And as the report emphasizes, it's not just COVID. You know, today we are witnessing increased attention on mental health due to this global convergence of conflict, pandemic, natural disaster, climate change, migration and displacement, and political instability, all with heavy implications on mental health and well-being. The impact on the most vulnerable communities and populations, such as minority groups or those in humanitarian and conflict settings, continuing to be disproportionately high. In addition to the pandemic's shining light on mental health, it remains to be true that one in seven children and adolescents ages 10 to 19 have a diagnosable mental, mental disorder, and that every 11 minutes, about one child in the same age group takes their own life somewhere in the world. Suicide is tragically among the top five causes of death for young people ages 15 to 19. And this puts a shocking point on the call to action on mental health. It is absolutely about saving lives. And we know that investing in mental health will yield, will yield massive returns to individuals, families, societies, and economies. And while the impact of, on children's lives is incalculable, a new study by the London School of Economics in the report analyzed lost human potential arising from mental health conditions and suicide in children and adults. 
analysis of findings indicates that conservatively, mental health conditions and suicide in children and adolescents cost $387 billion a year in terms of lost human potential. The second response to why now is the global call for action to address fragility of services and ensure better access to quality, accessible, affordable, and non-stigmatizing mental health services that are available within the community. The shift in understanding around mental health may also include a greater acceptance that people need support and can't just be expected to live through it alone. A Gallup survey carried out for UNICEF shows strong support for this in almost every country. Among those, surveys, among those surveyed, the research demonstrated that 83% of 15 to 24 year olds believe sharing experiences and seeking support is the best way to address mental health concerns. Sadly, there's almost no response to those calls for support. On average, just 2% of government health budgets are allocated to mental health spending, only a fraction of which is diverted to children and families, which means they spend basically nothing on promotion of mental health for general population and protection of most vulnerable groups, such as indigenous kids and LGBTQI plus adolescents who have terribly high rates of suicide. The third response to why now is that there is a lot we can do to promote and protect mental health. One of uh, the members of SOWC's technical advisory group said, we may not know everything we need to know but, or what we need to do, but we do know enough. And the idea frames a lot of UNICEF and partners thinking in terms of responses. We're focusing heavily on interventions that can work to better support parents, to make schools kinder, gentler places, and to use existing community care and social protection mechanisms to, to deliver mental health support. And the report also helped to highlight an approach to mental health which embraces a shift from thinking about mental health in biomedical terms, where the focus is on conditions to be diagnosed and medicated. In fact, we're moving away from this um, really harmful uh, misconception that you either have a mental disorder or you do not. Instead, mental health needs to be understood as a continuum. At any stage of our lives, any one of us find ourselves at different points on that continuum. We're all somewhere on this continuum. Some of us have good very good mental health, some of us have some mental health symptoms, some of us have a disorder, and some others have a chronic disabling condition. We all move back and forth on this continuum. So it's important that we move away from the stigmatizing and harmful misconception that you are either well or unwell. We need to reprogram our understanding of mental health. We need to understand our family, our friends, ourselves, as people somewhere on that spectrum of mental health and meet ourselves and others where they are at. And of course, children and adolescents and families are impacted by the biological, environmental, contextual factors in their lives, including family, community, sociocultural, economic, political, and legal influences, and, and the services and structures that surround them, all affecting the development of those children through the life course. And these factors have been articulated through various frameworks, all of which emphasize that children, adolescents, and families bring their own skills, assets, and resources for coping with challenges. And the social ecological model illustrates the importance of networks of people and structures that surround a child or adolescent, safeguarding and protecting their well-being. And for children and adolescents, key areas to do this are parenting, schools, and mental health programming. And this is an important uh, focus for UNICEF's work. So as mentioned earlier, UNICEF has elevated mental health as a global priority in advocacy, research, data, programming for the next few years. The SOWC report sets out a clear agenda for action that builds on three key messages, to break the silence, to call for investment, and to drive leadership and action. Let's break, down, let's break these down quickly. First, we need, psycho, we need mental health and psychosocial support services integrated within nutrition, education, child protection, and community support systems for children and families. And so we need urgent investment to make that happen across these different sectors. 
Second, we must address stigma at all levels by changing the public narrative around mental health and elevate the voices and actions of service users, including youth and caregivers. At, at UNICEF and within the report, we focus on addressing the ill treatment of children facing mental health crisis. Shackling and institutionalization remain widespread in some countries and communities. One of the contributors to, contributors to our perspective series in our report is this young woman, Leah Labaki, who is now an activist for people with psychosocial disabilities. She was institutionalized at the age of 13. She writes in her essay, there is no better way to promote mental health than to instill in the next generation the understanding that psychological distress is not deviant behavior to be repressed and hidden away, but just a normal aspect of human experience. Deinstitutionalization and community-based support will be key to achieving this. And so much more needs to be done to address mental health needs of children, including improved family-centered approaches to mental health and psychosocial care of children and adolescents through parenting support programs, promoting healthy family relationships and supporting caregiver, caregiver well-being and mental health. More intentional focus on schools and communities to ensure that no child is isolated and that MHPSS services are available for children who need them. Schools can bolster mental health by providing empowering learning opportunities and a platform for critical mental health services, but they can also be a risk factor. Places where children and young people are faced with violence, bullies, and stress in abusive learning environments. In the SOWC report, we include this new analysis um, by RTI International that indicates that good school-based interventions that address anxiety, depression, and suicide provide a return on investment of 21.5 US dollars for every $1 invested over the life of the child. We also need to invest in a competent mental health workforce, specialists and non-specialists to improve access to services and address varying, and ment uh, varying mental health needs through health, education, and social protection services or, or other entry points of core care. And lest we forget, we need to fill the data gap that helps inform policies and strengthen research and evidence generation in this space to ensure quality of services and programming for our precious children and our caregivers. And certainly we must continue to play a critical role in safeguarding mental health in humanitarian settings, including for refugee, uh, for young refugees and migrants. UNICEF will need to be hand in hand with the global mental health community and work across nations and with governments, and including here in the US, advocate, advocating for the passing of the MIND Act to ensure that continued efforts to address the mental health and psychosocial well-being of children is based in the latest evidence of need, using the most effective interventions and provided by a workforce that is skilled, capable, and relevant. Thank you so much. With that, I conclude my presentation. Now, please join us in viewing this important short video developed with Andre, a youth advocate for mental health from Peru, working to raise awareness on mental health issues, empowered by his own experiences and advocating for better access to affordable and non-stigmatizing quality services within his country. Let's watch it together. Yo vivo en Coyique, vivo en la casa de mi tía con mi mamá en un pequeño cuarto donde compartimos habitación los dos. Me gusta escuchar música, jugar, leer sobre algunos temas. También me gustaría hacer un gran cambio en esta sociedad. Mi hijo es muy alegre, es bromista. Habla mucho, un montón. Yo creo que es un niño muy inteligente y siempre se le he dicho. Lo fui a recoger al colegio, entonces salió el psicólogo y me dijo que, que ahí mi hijo necesitaba una ayuda psicológica. Ese día se había puesto mal, se habían puesto debajo de la mesa a llorar y lo único que repetía era que se quería morir. Me sentía mal y tenía como decirlo, esta ansiedad. Tenía muchas náuseas, no quería comer. Después de hacerme algunas preguntas en el centro médico, 
supieron qué es lo que yo tenía. Me fueron de gran ayuda. Principalmente creo que fue bueno que me escucharan. Ha recibido tanto atención psiquiátrica, psicológica, psicoeducación de parte de enfermería y también la atención de trabajo social. Eh, han servido para que él pueda hacer un cambio en su vida. Ser adolescente nunca ha sido fácil, pero en el contexto de pandemia, los y las adolescentes se han enfrentado a una situación nueva y bastante estresante para ellos y ellas. ¿no? Tres de cada diez eh, chicos y chicas tienen algún problema de salud mental. Para nosotros fue una ventaja tener previamente ya instalados estos servicios de salud mental en la comunidad. Han sido prácticamente el bastión que nos ha ayudado a mantener la atención especialmente en nuestros usuarios con problemas severos. Decirle a mi hijo, que lo quiero mucho, que es un valiente, creo que con este testimonio que estamos dando vamos a ayudar a muchas personas. Es mejor tener una buena salud mental que tratar de vivir en una mentira, diciendo que estás bien cuando en realidad no lo estás. Thank you very much. My name is Ana de Mendoza. I am UNICEF representative in Peru. I hope you have liked the video. The story that we are telling in the video is the story of many of our adolescents and kids that uh, during the last two years have been uh, going through a lot of stress related to the pandemic. No? So what I would like to tell you a little bit is about how is the situation in Peru and what is UNICEF doing in order to strengthen mental health services. As we have seen in the video today, perhaps more than ever, children's mental health and the problems that affect them have become more visible. It has to be mentioned that these problems have always been present, but uh, we think that the COVID pandemic have put them much more visible now. No? As we were saying, uh, two out of the five leading causes of mortality in adolescents have to do with, um, with uh, mental health problems. No? And these problems have been worsened during the pandemic since children and adolescents in Peru were the ones who had the most restrictions. Especially during the first eight months, they were not able to go to the street at any time. So they were keeping locked uh, at their homes And the, the change toward virtual schooling, and in many cases, non-schooling due to connectivity problems, the lack of interaction with the school environment and its reports, the lack of interaction with peers, and the lack of use of public spaces for playing uh, physics and sports have forced this uh, population of adolescents to adapt quickly to a new stressful circumstances. No? And, we think that they have lost many of their natural and everyday environments. We have to say that the schools are still closed in Peru, most of them, only 5% of children have gone into semi-presential schools. And we see a very big link between mental health and uh, going back to school. We finalized uh, uh, um, a research with the Ministry of Health And it shows that three out of 10 uh, children and adolescents were having uh, mental health uh, problems. But when we ask uh, about children who were uh, delinked with the school or they have been lost their contact with the teachers, these figures went up to seven out of 10. So that gives us a clear clue that uh, schooling and going back to school It's a, a, a preventive measure on uh, mental health issues. No? The pandemic has revealed also that the levels of domestic violence have increased, calls to the hotline uh, uh, that we have researched have increased uh, 205% during the pandemic compared uh, with the figures of 2019. And also the economic and labor instability of households have generated various situations of tension or exacerbate them that already exist. We have, to be, we have to take into account that during the lockdown, it was very difficult for children or women to go for help. 
and it was uh, it seems that the violence against children and women has increased a lot. No? Um, these have uh, clear repercussions on the mental health of children and their family. And uh, we have seen that these emotional difficulties have to do with greater symptoms like depression, anxiety, change in behavior, performance difficulties. Uh, many of these signs of deterioration are not very visible because we have lack of information. There are taboos around uh, mental health and there are not sufficient spaces for guidance for parents, schools, and community actors. No? So from UNICEF, as uh, my colleague was mentioning, we think that mental health is a crucial part for integral development on all stages of life, but especially in childhood and adolescence. Without this uh, biopsychological balance, children and adolescents will not be able to achieve their potential. And this can lead also to the loss of development opportunities through their lives. Um, we, 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 are, we have clear the link between uh, school performance and uh, problems of learning at schools with uh, adolescents and children who have conditions as, such as anxiety or, or depression. And we have also cleared the link about uh, how to prevent uh, mental health situations, supporting with peers and seeking help also uh, at, 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 at the social protection and child protection system. No. So what is doing UNICEF in Peru? UNICEF is in constant coordination with education, protection and health sectors and contributing that the, the Peruvian states uh, could be able to recognize uh, mental health as, uh, as uh, something that has to be provided, mental health services that have to be provided in order to guarantee uh, all uh, uh, rights of the children. No? What kind of things are we doing? We are, uh, first of all, we are supporting policies. Uh, there, there, there has been a, a, a great improvement in, in policies uh, in Peru, and we have been supporting that. In, 2000, in 2019, Peru passed a new uh, national law on mental health. And as a result of these actions, we are also promoting pilot community-based mental health care centers. And we have increased, increased these numbers from 22 in 2015 to 203 in 2021. Still, if you, if you think in a big country as Peru, uh, 20, uh, 200 uh, health centers are not enough to, to seek the needs of the adolescents. So, uh, we have been uh, supporting the government also in research, in gathering evidence and analyzing data, as this uh, survey that I was mentioning about mental health that we did uh, last year. We are piloting these community services and we are piloting also helplines. We have been um, trying to implement uh, innovative helplines so that children and adolescents uh, can have a, a counseling service and can be referred to specific um, centers if they are able to. But we are still uh, having a lot of challenge. No? As we were saying, we need to de demystify mental health. Mental health is a continuum, and we all can be subjects to uh, different degrees of this uh, of stress. We have to expand community-based services. They are not enough to cover the whole population, and we have to develop also specific programs to address vulnerable populations, and we have to make sure that these um, services are culturally um, pertinent and they are embracing the whole diversity that we have in Peru. We still have to advocate for more, for more investment in funds and also uh, investment in human resources. We need to have specialized um, colleagues, not only from the health sector, but also from the social protection and the child protection uh, sector to understand that uh, mental health is part of the health that we have to promote. And we, for sure, we have to invest in prevention. Opening the schools, it's uh, a way to prevent mental health disorders, but having also public spaces and giving uh, the adolescents the opportunity to put their voice and to express their opinions is also a part of preventing mental health. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anna. And the work that you're doing in Peru is, is just incredible in support of children. And so thank you for that. So my name is Anuka Brown and I currently serve as the Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer at UNICEF USA. And it is my incredible pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Barlow. She's director, the director of John Hopkins Center for American Indian Health, as well as Dr. Victoria O'Keefe, inaugural Maturam Santosha Chair in the Native American Health at Johns Hopkins University. And both Dr. Marlowe and Dr. O'Keefe have been incredibly instru instrumental in this partnership between UNICEF USA and Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health to support the mental health and psychosocial interventions in tribal and urban communities. And so I'll turn it over to them to speak about this partnership and the great work. We're incredibly proud of this partnership. Over to you. Thank you so much, Anuka. And it has just been a profound um, pleasure to work with UNICEF. You came in like angels um, at the beginning of the pandemic to help us with our work to promote mental health for Native American children who suffer the worst mental health indicators of any um, racial group in the United States. Next slide, please, Victoria. Um, I think what it's so important to understand is that historical trauma resulting from ruthless acts of colonization and continued racism directly impact Native American children's health. And it is incumbent upon our nation to reconcile this dark past for true healing and mental health promotion. It is in this spirit that Dr. O'Keefe and I wanna offer this land acknowledgement. We humbly acknowledge we are located on the traditional homelands of indigenous peoples. Together, we recognize the history of genocide and ongoing systemic inequities that indigenous people suffer. We respect all tribal nations sovereignty. We aim to hold ourselves accountable to tribal nations and the federal treaties that pledge support for health and education in perpetuity for indigenous peoples in exchange for land. And there's a link here. Um, when you have time, please go to this link and find out who the indigenous peoples homelands that you reside on. Next slide, please. I just wanna give you um, a little bit of brief background on our center at Johns Hopkins. Um, we were founded 30 years ago by Matram Santosham, who's a pediatrician from India. Um, our mission is to work in partnership with Native communities to raise health education and health leadership to the highest possible level. And we do that by building together strengths-based solutions that honor and promote tribal sovereignty. We also work across the lifespan for kids for children. So working in community context to understand how there can be strengths-based programs promoting mental, behavioral, physical health um, that really connect to local culture and also are age appropriate. And those um, programs highlighted in yellow are those that are specifically to promote mental health. We know that indigenous peoples are from hundreds of tribes and are the first peoples of the lands now called the United States. Tribal communities and native peoples continue to demonstrate immense strengths rooted in our diverse tribal worldviews, value systems, and traditions. These strengths are passed on from our ancestors to our current generation and will be passed on for future generations to come. The strengths and leadership of Native communities are passed on despite hundreds of years of genocide, land theft, ongoing colonization, oppression, and a legacy of historical trauma. Health and mental health inequities result from ongoing colonization and oppression, including a disregard by the federal government and their trust responsibility to provide healthcare and other services to tribes. And we know that COVID-19 shed light on some of these longstanding inequities. Though there are high rates of mental health inequities, it's important to note that Native communities also show high rates of positive mental health and many, many strengths. And while there's an immediate concern about COVID-19, um, tribal communities we know have experienced disproportionately higher infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates that are linked to social determinants of health. Things like lack of running water, electricity, broadband access, overcrowded and multi-generational homes, and food and water insecurity. 
The mental health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will be long lasting for all communities globally. And this includes indigenous communities and we must prioritize this. Our Center for American Indian Health motto during COVID-19 continues to be, all we can do is everything we can do. We worked with numerous community partners to support distribution of wellness boxes with food and water and other necessary supplies, building hand washing stations for those who did not have running water, expanding local contact tracing with community health workers, and getting public health data to tribes so they can make the best policy decisions to keep their communities safe. We also worked on mental health focus projects during COVID-19 that we'll highlight soon. Our indigenous communities have much to teach the world about health and wellness through collective will and responsibility and intergenerational and holistic connectedness to protect all people, all living, living beings and our sacred lands. And today we're excited to share some of our center's mental health promotion work highlighting five different projects. First, I'm going to talk about Culture Forward, which is a strength and culture-based tool to protect our native youth from suicide. We held dozens of listening sessions, hearing from tribal leaders, native youth, community and grassroots leaders, traditional healers and elders about what this guide about native youth suicide prevention should include and how it should be distributed. And we listened to all of these voices and have shared it in this way. The resulting Culture Forward Guide honors and empowers communities by weaving strands of knowledges, stories, and practical resources, highlighting Native communities and youth strengths. Our second project, Psychological First Aid for COVID-19 Frontline Workers and Native Communities was funded by UNICEF USA. And this is a resource guide and online training that we culturally adapted with a team of indigenous frontline workers and mental health experts from across the United States. We know that the mental health needs of frontline workers during the COVID pandemic can outpace the availability of services for mental health professionals. And we hope that this guide and training that is culturally relevant and culturally specific can support the mental health of frontline workers who are serving our native communities day in and day out during the pandemic. Another project that has been truly heartwarming to work on with a large team is a storybook series called Our Smallest Warriors, Our Strongest Medicine. The original book is a cultural adaptation of My Hero Is You, developed by the Interagency Standing Committee. And we worked with a large team of indigenous public health, mental health, and health communications experts, and a really talented native youth artist who developed all of the illustrations. The two books that we've developed weave together shared cultural values across tribal communities, public health guidance, and mental health coping strategies to help Native children and families cope during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've distributed more than 77,000 copies of this book to families from more than 100 tribes across 25 states and 12 First Nations communities in Canada. And we continue to hear positive feedback from caregivers about how their children express the importance of having Native representation in children's books and how these books have provided a better understanding of coping uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Indigenous Stories of Strength is a collaborative project that aims to feature the leadership and resilience of Native communities and peoples in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will share and amplify stories of Indigenous strength and survivance that illuminate leadership from individuals, groups, and communities related to the pandemic through a virtual showcase event that we're hosting next month. By bringing together and sharing these stories, we hope to reinforce a strengths-based narrative of Native communities to support frameworks for policy creation and change at tribal, regional, and national levels. And I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Barlow. Thank you so much. We also in the spring launched a broad initiative to help get Native children back to school. During the pandemic, many Native American children had no structured education whatsoever because of a lack of broadband access. They and their parents are coming back with increased mental health risks, and we're doing everything we can to build programs to support them. 
Um, another program I want to talk about is Family Spirit. This is an early childhood home visiting program at the center designed with tribal communities over a 20-year period. It's been proven as an effective program um, through numerous randomized controlled trials and now is in over 150 tribal communities across the United States. Next slide, please. It, um, its components are um, family-based outreach that is uh, with very structured lessons taught by Indigenous uh, family health coaches. And as I mentioned, um, we've been able to expand 150 tribal communities through federal support like MICV, um, Indian Health Service, and tribal health programs. Our latest work in this area in the app in, in um, response Response to COVID is developing six skill-based mental health lessons that can be integrated with family spirit. They are addressing these key problems that we've been able to observe in tribal communities, depression, anxiety, substance use, suicide, increased interpersonal violence, PTSD, and unresolved grief. And finally, we just wanna end with a plea that um, there is a need for greater private and federal funding for indigenous mental health practitioners at all levels. The lack of mental health practitioners who are indigenous in these communities results in huge barriers to care. And secondly, to focus funds on strengths-based indigenous design, mental health programming and solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was, that, again, incredible and just uh, so grateful for the partnership and the work that you continue to do. Um, so I, I, what I'm going to do is we're, we're going to bring all of our panelists and presenters together, and I'm going to host a moderated session right now. And so, again, wel welcoming back uh, Dr. Jazzy, Anna Di Mendoza, um, Dr. Barlow, and Dr. Victoria O'Keefe. And so I have a, a few questions I'm going to ask you. Some of them um, will, you'll have an opportunity for everyone to answer. Some of them are more specific to the work that you're doing on the ground in your communities. Um, so I'll start with this one. Um, and I think we are, are we putting all of our participants on for us? Okay, so we're going to start here. I, I see, um, Dr. Oh, here we are. One more, Anna. Waiting for Anna to get on. Okay, here we go. So welcome. I'm glad we got to bring you all together. The Zoom environment is always interesting, a little bit of a lag, um, but well, let's get started. So first I'll start with what recommendations do you have for governments to support the mental health of children and adolescents? Let's start there. Um, any of you can take that question. Well, I would take it. I think one of the recommendations is to invest in mental health and make a mental health part of the integral social protection and child protection system. So not, a, some, not something separate related to the mental, uh, to the health sector, but um, with, a, with a strong focus on community-based services and prevention services through schools, child protection services, and so on. That would be my first recommendation. And maybe okay. to jump, jump in and add to, to Anna's um, response, um, I, absolutely, I think urgent investment is, is going to be critical um, for governments to really tackle this global uh, burden. Um, I think more, more specifically as well, we can really, really, governments need to step up and advance some of the laws and policies, um, the advocacy and the human rights for improved mental health and psychosocial well-being and development of children. Um, and of course, yes, this, uh, like Anna said, this includes higher government spending, it also includes redirecting and pr the prioritization of those of that funding from institutional care to community-based care in schools and in families. Um, of course, another thing that governments need to take on is a workforce development piece. And so really working to, especially in communities that are impoverished where access to affordable mental health care is not always uh, available. We need to be growing a health education and 
social service competent workforce um, that is able to tackle and manage minor to moderate cases and then able and then refer and with, with a functioning referral mechanism in place to refer those with severe uh, mental health issues. Um, and of course, we need to governments need to be advocating um, and, and contributing to additional evidence generation but also uh, working to fill the data gap that is important to inform their very own policies and planning for uh, addressing the mental health needs of children and, and adolescents. Thank you. Dr. Barlow, Dr. O'Keefe. The greatest investments that federal government can make is, is upstream. It's early intervention, cross-generational. That is the way to prevent suicide and substance use and other issues that affect adolescents later in life. So early and, and um, preventative. And I would just add also um, federal governments respecting indigenous peoples and their communities, um, especially the self-determination over health and mental health care, which can include services like traditional healing or land-based services to promote mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so here's here's a, your second question. What can we learn from indigenous communities in particular about community based strategies for mental health promotion? And similarly, what can we learn from youth to support community based strategies and mental health promotion? And so I'll I will ask that to to both to Anna, Dr. Barlow and uh, Dr. O'Keefe. We'll start with you, Anna. Oh, you're on mute. So we'll we'll go over to um to Allison and we'll start her until we get Anna off. I think what I've learned so much from Indigenous communities over my career is um, strengths-based approaches, really understanding that language and cultures have the keys to promoting positive mental health off across the life course, number one. Number two, task shifting. The idea of, um, of employing a workforce of community mental health specialists that provide the liaisonship between clinical services and families, I think is a key learning in Native communities. Thank you. Victoria, anything to add there? Sure, I think we can learn from, although there's a lot of diversity across indigenous communities and tribal nations, there are some shared cultural values across communities. For example, one is that our mental health is linked to our physical health, our emotional health and our spiritual health. You can't just separate it out from all of those other areas of health and wellness. And I feel like if, if everyone um, really understood that and took that to heart, I think we would also see a shift in the way that we um, we talk about and we treat mental health in relation to our overall wellness. Thank you. I, I would add also that one thing that we can learn is how peer support and networking, it's a, a very good prevent, uh, prevention measure. No? If we think about how young people is facing mental health issues, this demystifying the fact of that everyone can have mental health problems in a certain state, I think is a quite positive. And I think to support this peer support and networks also in indigenous community. And I think one thing that we have to learn also is with, that we have to adapt services to different populations. So it's not the same to, to, to talk with an adolescent than to an adult. And it's not the same to talk in Spanish or in English or in a, another indigenous uh, language. So we have to take into account the cultural diversity and the cultural pertinency of the services that we are using. Thank you, Anna. Um, what, are, what are some of the biggest factors that shape mental health in children and adolescents and caregivers? I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Hijazi for that answer. Uh, thank you, and it's um, it's, a, it's a really important question. Um, you know, for children, nurturing care from and for parents and caregivers really matters. Um, so to do safe and engaging learning environments where children can develop soft skills and resilience. And as children enter their adolescent years, peer relationships can face, shape lifelong norms and attitudes. Uh, I think the world at large imprints on mental health. So as the WC reports, 
poverty undermines the physical and mental health and, uh, um, of children and can expose children to violence and trauma. Discrimination can expose children to disadvantage, prejudice, and social exclusion. And humanitarian crises and pandemics like COVID-19 can lead to extreme and lasting distress. Um, and you know, I think the pandemic, maybe speaking to that really quickly, has dealt an additional blow to children who rely on support for specific mental health challenges. Um, for example, according to WHO, um, mental health services for children and adolescents were disrupted in more than two thirds of 130 countries that were surveyed, while school mental health services were disrupted in almost four out of five countries. So um, I think it's, it, it's all of it. Everything shapes mental health and we need to see mental health as an accelerator for other outcomes that we seek to also um, address uh, through the varying work that we do. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our panelists. This is just incredible work and in, in your commitment to this work on the ground in your communities and communities that you serve is, is not going unnoticed. So we thank our panelists today. Um, we're going to transition over to um, the next uh, piece, which is I am thrilled to introduce remarks from our newest UNICEF ambassador, Jeremy Lin. UNICEF USA appointed professional basketball player Jeremy Lin as a UNICEF ambassador in, in tandem with World Mental Health Day just recently. And Jeremy has been com a committed champion to helping break the silence surrounding mental health, having worked with UNICEF since 2020. Um, Jeremy Lin is one of the first Asian Americans to play in the NBA and also win an, an a NBA championship. And so he is currently signed with the Beijing Ducks for the 21-22 Chinese Basketball Association season. I'm Jeremy Lin. I am very excited to be part of UNICEF's State of the World Children Report launch. And we know that this report launch uh, is centering around mental health, um, which is why I chose to be an advocate. This is huge for me. I wish I uh, cared and, and dove more into my mental health at a, a younger age, but recently I've gotten a sports psychologist and I started therapy once a week as well to try to make me a better uh, person mentally um, as well as a better player. So a lot of people see me as an athlete on the court, um, but what they don't realize and what they don't see is the anxiety that I used to really struggle with before games to the point where I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Um, I had so much anxiety, I would sometimes just crawl up into a ball and I had no energy or willpower to do anything. And, um, you know, those were some of my, my uh, wrestling matches with anxiety. And so because of that, I wanted to be a part of different um, mental health uh, events. And, uh, you know, for example, Mental Health Action Day, that's, that's one that we did last year. Um, but definitely just spreading awareness and destigmatizing mental health uh, is something I want to do. Uh, when I uh, am overwhelmed with anxiety, one of the ways I try to manage my mental health um, is to fall back into my faith, uh, reminding myself that I'm more than just a basketball player, how many points I scored or whether we win. Um, actually, what I do on and on the court and off the court does not change how much Jesus loves me. And so getting my identity back as a person and not just a basketball player allows me to be able to handle some of the fears and anxiety I have around what might happen in the game. Um, I also... Uh, lean into therapy, which which helps me a lot as well, talking to a therapist um, and being able to just sharpen my mind and, and work through past experiences that may have traumatized me or really negatively affect me. And the last one I would say is to find somebody that you trust that you can talk to, even outside of your therapist, it could be a friend, a family member, but just finding one person to just reach out, to boldly reach out and, and talk to them and say, hey, uh, can you listen? Or hey, can I get some help? Or can I get a gear? Uh, and, 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 a, and a shoulder to lean on to cry on. Um, that's really helpful for me. One of the biggest misconceptions about mental health is that um, if you struggle with anxiety or different things, people just say, oh, you're just weak or um, you know, just, just fight through it or get over it. Um, and I think that's really interesting because when, we, when it comes to physical health, we put such a high premium on it. And we're like, if someone is born with something where they may be weaker in a certain muscle or they may have a hurt knee or hurt back. It's like we do everything to try to care for it to make them the best athlete they can be. But there are certain things that a lot of people might struggle with anxiety or different personalities or different things that um, might make people more anxious or you know, to have certain things that tie into mental health. And people don't realize that the mind is also something that you must strengthen. Mental health and the mind is something 
that we need to spend a lot of care on and we can't only worry about our physical bodies. We all know that COVID and the pandemic has really negatively affected the world. And, um, and we know that a lot of youth right now, they have gone through things that uh, people haven't gone through in generations. So we have to understand that a lot of the youth um, have been struggling with you know, being isolated, um, not being able to have the normal social interactions. And, and that's just you know, the tip of the iceberg. And I remember talking to different um, organizations, teachers, even like congresswomen in the US, congressmen, like the one thing they keep saying is our youth need mental health resources. And coming out of the pandemic, one of the big things they said is we need our youth to find their confidence, their self-esteem. They need to find that joy about what they had before. And I think that goes to show just how important mental health is, especially now after going through a pandemic. I mean, going forward for me, the one thing that gets me really excited um, is I just hope to kind of be uh, a microphone or a megaphone for some of the youth. And a lot of the conversations that we've been having, a lot of the youth are all talking about, you know, we need to learn more about mental health or we need more help with mental health or we need more resources or we need to be able to talk about it more often so that, you know, parents or decision makers or other people might not feel like there's a stigma around it. And so um, for me, it's pretty simple. I just want to use my platform and, and my my influence just to be able to kind of be a megaphone and, and relay that message um, on behalf of the youth, because I think that's what they're saying. And I think we need to listen. Lastly, I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, this is something special. And, and I really hope that um, the lives of many youth will be changed because of what you guys are doing. So thank you again for letting me be a part of it. Well, we really thank Jeremy Lin for doing this. And I get the honor of tran transitioning from Jeremy Lin to Senator Bob Casey. Senator, thank you so much for joining us today. Just a Super quick introduction. Senator Casey is a true champion for children, both here in the United States and around the world, uh, with a special focus on children with disabilities. He is a strong voice in the US Congress about the importance of protecting mental health, especially for children and their caregivers. Senator Casey, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Anucha, and, and so many others who make this possible. I wanna thank UNICEF USA for hosting this critical event today and all that it means for the mental health of children uh, throughout our country, but especially throughout the world, because we're focused on their mental health today during an event like this. I don't have to tell anyone of the adverse impact this terrible pandemic has had caused by uh, this horrific virus and the adverse impact it had on children in so many ways and families uh, and the, 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 the family unit overall, whether it was job loss or food insecurity or isolation or even violence, uh, the adverse imp impact upon children, I'm not sure is even calculable right now. We, there are a lot of numbers that, uh, that we could uh, cite. I, I won't try to do that because there's so many, uh, so many numbers but I just start, start with maybe just one or two. One is the number 13, 13. 13% 13 of adolescents ages 10 to 19 live with a diagnosed mental disorder with anxiety and depression uh, making up 40% uh, of that number. So 13% of adolescents across the world and we know the adverse consequences that impact those children long before the pandemic, but ever more so uh, in the grip of in the aftermath of this pandemic. We know that uh, caregivers are part of what we have, are part of the story here in terms of what we must focus on. We're told by the Lancet Commission that um, a high percentage of children around the world live with a parent with a mental health uh, disorder. So that obviously points to a challenge. And other than that 13% number of, adult, of, of adolescents ages 10 to 19 living with a diagnosed mental disorder, the other number that jumps out at me is two. Uh, only 2% of the government spending uh, by most governments in the world uh, are spent on mental health, just 2%. 
and governments in the developing world, the de developing nations have spent less than, uh, less than that in many cases. So 2% is not enough. We've got to invest in the mental health of our children. Part of this, of course, is having the federal government here at home focus our resources and our energy uh, behind efforts to make sure that we're focused on uh, these issues more globally. That's why I've worked with a member of Congress, a member of the House, uh, United States Representative Ted Deutsch. He and I have introduced some mental health in International Development and Humanitarian Settings Act, the so-called MINDS Act, M-I-N-D-S, the MINDS Act. Here's what we're gonna do with that bill. When we pass this bill, we will codify into law uh, a position which many of you already know about, the position of USAID's coordinator for mental health and psychosocial support, the so-called MHPSS. We're gonna codify that coordinator uh, by way of passing the statute. Second, we're gonna establish a working group led by that coordinator to ensure that there's interagency uh, coordination across uh, USAID as well as the State Department on the MHPSS programming in foreign assistance. We gotta make sure that we're sending foreign assistance around the world, uh, which is so important to uh, what we do as Americans, but especially the impact it can have around the world. We gotta make sure that, that those foreign assistance dollars are targeted uh, on the, the priority of treating children's mental health. So we're gonna make sure that we do that with this legislation by having the coordinator in law and by having, having the, uh, the working group. We're also gonna make sure that this becomes uh, an issue that's, that's more widely focused on and, and more the subject of our attention when we're talking about foreign assistance, when we're talking about foreign policy, because we can't have, have uh, a healthy world unless we have healthy children. We can't have healthy children unless they, are, they have the kind of mental health supports and services that they need. So thank you to UNICEF for all that you're doing. As John Fitzgerald Kennedy said when he became president way back in 1961, uh, John Kennedy said this. He said, here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. You're doing God's work. Thank you for doing it. Thanks for helping the children of our world. God bless your work. Thanks. Senator Casey, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate all the work you've done on the Minds Act, as well as the legislation you, you've sponsored and co-sponsored to help kids uh, with mental health issues here in the United States. So truly a champion for children. Thank you so much. So we opened with one of our, our youth council members, and we're gonna close with another one of our great national youth council members. I will turn the gavel over to UNICEF USA national youth council member, Siddharth. Siddharth is a high school senior from New Jersey focused on international political and scientific advocacy and has also served as a youth delegate to the United Nations. Sid, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Engman, and thank you to all the panelists today who shared with us their expertise and their work on expanding mental health advocacy. I think to close off today, I'd like to start with a quick anecdote of my personal life. When I was 10, I broke the vase that was very much valued in my family and sat on the mantle of our living room. Thankfully, when I did this, no one was at home, and I was able to collect the shards of glass as they fell on the floor and stash it in the bottom of the trash can. There it was where no one could see. This anecdote of childish innocence is not just a story, but also a simile to the way in which our society has long approached mental health. Right now is a time for action. As you've heard today, the COVID-19 pandemic has upended our world, creating a global crisis that is unprecedented in our lifetimes. But the pandemic also offers an opportunity to reimagine a world for children, Mental health is a basic right and essential for achieving the sustainable development goals. And UNICEF USA is taking action by calling on supporters to advocate for federal legislation that would close the gap between mental health needs and access to services 
both in the US and across the globe. This includes, first, helping to pass the Mental Health Services for Students Act, a bill which would provide grant funding for US public schools to provide on-site, culturally and linguistically appropriate mental health services for students. Not only do schools provide a safe and secure learning environment, school interventions can reach children and young people at most risk, including those who might otherwise not have access to these services. But second, it's championing the Mental Health and International Development and Humanitarian Settings Act, which Senator Bob Casey just described. It's the first ever US legislation which would support the integration of mental health services and US foreign assistance programming. Less than 1% of health-related global development assistance goes towards mental health. UNICEF USA echoes UNICEF's call to promote and protect mental health for every child. To do that, we need first a commitment from leaders like the US government backed by investment. Second, communication that breaks down stigma and opens up conversations on mental health. And third, action to strengthen the capacity of health education, social protection, and other sectors to better support families, schools, and our communities. Our psyches are delicate like the glass on the mantle. They've been nurtured in the love and company of those around us, but that does not make them unbreakable. Sometimes we can shatter, and rather than hide it to the best of our ability, we need to learn to be vulnerable, because the same way the love nurtured us, it can also heal us. All we need to do is know that we deserve better than to be stashed at the bottom of the trash can. Thank you. Folks, that concludes our excellent program. Thank you so much, Sid, that was excellent. Um, again, this, this was recorded, so we will try to get the link to the recording out to all registrants. Thank you for your time today, and please do what you can to support children's mental health in the United States and around the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.